Guys, we're living in uncertain times. I don't even know what tomorrow holds, but we serve the God who does. I don't know what's getting ready to come down, but I know who's getting ready to go up. And that's you and I. We will fear no evil. I'm going to be talking a little bit about Nebuchadnezzar's dream here. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 31, starting with verse 31, it says, You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, this great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron, partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Guys, this passage of scripture is uh, Daniel's interpretation of, of a dream the Lord gave to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. The king saw a large image of a man whose body was divided into parts, made up of different substances. Daniel interpreted each part of the image to represent one of the major world empires to come. Two empires, Egypt and Assyria, had already declined by the time of the king's dream, Therefore, they were not included. In King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, five world empires were seen, beginning with his own kingdom. The dream ends with the coming of the eternal kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, described in verse 35. Uh, concerning that image of the, of the large man, Daniel 2, verse 38 says thou, referring to Nebuchadnezzar, art this head of gold. The head of gold represented the Babylonian Empire, which was holding Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, in captivity at that time. Daniel himself was one of the captives. The kingdoms which would follow the Babylonian Empire, depicted as different metals, were seen in descending power. Verse 39 says, But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Verse 40 says, And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, in as much as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. The chest of silver was the coming kingdom of the Persians, guys, which would appear later in chapter 5 of the book of Daniel. The Persian Empire would be instrumental in returning the Jews to Israel. The belly and thighs of brass were the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great. This empire would develop and teach the whole known world the Greek language. This common language would give all nations the ability to read the New Testament when it was written. The iron legs are the longest part of the body, and they represented the Roman Empire, which lasted almost 1,000 years. It is this iron kingdom which would see the birth, earthly life, and ministry, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Roman Empire would be the last kingdom to hold Israel captive, and it would also torment, persecute, and kill both Jews and Christians before its downfall. Once Jesus rose from the dead and the church began at Pentecost, world empires or governments which controlled the entire world, entire known world of their time, 
would cease to exist. King Nebuchadnezzar's dream makes it clear that as long as a church is on the earth, no natural kingdom can rule the entire earth. However, guys, once the church has been removed, and I'm talking about the rapture, the, the Iron Empire will arise again in a different form. In Daniel 2 verse 41 says, Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of powder's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with clay. Verse 42, And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. The feet of iron and clay represent a revived version of the former Roman Empire, which will come after the church age. This last world empire, like the feet in the dream, will be the shortest kingdom of all and the most unstable. Its control of the rest of the world will be far less powerful, but its leader will be more wicked and ruthless than any leader in history. And this man is Satan's man, the Antichrist. Daniel 2.44 says, And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Verse 45 says, Inasmuch as you saw that the stones was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Guys, once the church is gone, the earth will return back to Jewish time for seven more years. Uh, the 70th week of Daniel. Known, and it will be known as the tribulation. Time will take up where it left off before the church age began at Pentecost. As the feet of iron and clay in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the revived Roman Empire will rise up as a world power and again control Israel. Once more, that empire will attempt to destroy Jerusalem and the Jewish people. The small stone at the end of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, it represents the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who will keep Israel from being destroyed. Jesus himself, the small stone cut out without hands, that's in reference to his virgin birth, will strike the fragile feet of the revived Roman Empire led by the Antichrist. The entire image will come crashing down, which signifies that all world empires will come to an end forever. Um, then as the image crumbles to the ground, the small stone will grow into a mountain and fill the whole earth. Revelations eleven fifteen mentions the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever. Guys, the millennium is a 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ. That's when it will begin. I can't hardly wait. We'll rule and reign with him at that day, on that day. Every world empire in history had a religion, and the last kingdom of iron and clay, uh, the revived Roman Empire, will also have a religion. It will consist of all religions from all the empires 
that came before it. But I just want to say again that every world empire in history had a religion. And, and, and the revived Roman Empire will have all this. Uh, and, and these religions include both the five empires depicted in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, plus the Egyptian and Assyrian empires which preceded them, which is a total of seven kingdoms. The Apostle John writes of this in Revelation chapter 17 when he saw a woman, a prostitute, sitting on a beast with seven heads. I call this religious Babylon. The woman represents the religion of the last empire, the revived Roman Empire, and the seven heads represent the seven world empires which existed before the eternal reign of the Lord Jesus. Now, I call the Babylon mentioned in Revelation chapter 18, verse 10, the political Babylon. In in, uh, Revelation 17, verse 9, it says, The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. Uh, The seven heads are seven mountains, or in other words, world empires, on which the woman sits or draws power from. And there are seven kings, five have fallen, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and Greece, and one is, uh, and, and the other is not yet come. When the Antichrist comes, he must continue a short space, which will be seven years. Each world empire dominated and controlled Israel for a time. Each one of their religions was Satan's attempt to counterfeit Christianity, gaining false authority and power over people through mysticism, spiritism, and even witchcraft. The last world religion is in the earth right now. It is the one world religion that is rising. Revelation 17.3 says, This woman is full of names of blasphemies, the blasphemies of the one world religion combine all deities and religions into one final mockery of the righteousness of God. Guys, that brings us to the question, why does the Holy Spirit use a prostitute to represent false religion? A prostitute is the counterfeit of a wife. She provides a sexual act of marriage without love, fidelity, or honor. In other words, there is no commitment with a prostitute, just the exchange of money. There is also a lack of fulfillment and peace, which only comes with a marriage. The one world religion gives the ritual of religion and supernatural experience without a personal relationship with God, which can only come through the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no call to sanctification and no peace or fulfillment. Furthermore, just as the prostitute drains her victims of prosperity, leaving them destitute, so will the one world religion rob the people of their wealth and goods. Facets of this religion have been around as long as world empires have existed. The world... The one world religion of today incorporates all of the deities and religious practices of the Egyptians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, and Romans. The little stone which will cause the image to topple will also bring to an end all false religions in the earth. Guys, it's like this. We fly soon. We fly soon. Earthquakes are rocking everywhere. There are shocks and aftershocks running spiritually through the church, which with each day's newscast, we can hold our daily newspaper beside the books of Daniel, Zechariah, Matthew, and Revelation, marveling at the foreknowledge and wisdom of God. We can also be thankful that we know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
rejoicing that we will soon be delivered from Satan's rule in this earth. There are many in the church today who are telling you what to look for concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, some claim they have heard from God or even declaring exact dates for certain events. As with many other predictions of the past, many only wait and see, but I do not put my trust in any date. However, we are in the rapture season. In this present time, the Holy Spirit has been moving and preparing the body of Christ through dreams, prophecies, and visions for events soon to come, and many are pointing to the very soon coming rapture. Uh, Prophecies have been issued in the last few years concerning worldwide revivals. I've heard a few, but I believe that will be after the rapture of the church when the 144,000 rise up and begin to preach and the two witnesses start prophesying. Guys, during that time, in the tribulation, even an angel will be flying through the air with the good news. In Revelation uh, 14, verses 6 and 7, it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Verse 7 says, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. The Bible talks about that before the coming tribulation, three regions of the world will begin to take center stage during church, church age, which it has been going on. These areas will start to escalate into key players before the seven years of world uh, catastrophe. Since their rise and growth are predicted by the Word of God, we can look to them now as time clocks, telling us how much closer we are to the coming of the of the Lord. These three regions are Israel, Russia, and Western Europe. We've all heard of the fig tree generation. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 32 says, Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as the twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. Verse 34 says, Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. The generation Jesus was referring to was the generation which would see the fig tree begin to put forth leaves. Guys, that generation is ours. The fig tree is symbolic of Israel, and the Bible is saying that while it is still tender and growing, it will begin to put forth leaves. The leaves indicate economic and political prosperity. We have seen those leaves spring forth in our lifetime. Not long after becoming a state in 1948, Israel developed into a world power. This little nation has survived attack after attack and won several wars. It has become a tremendous economic force in the world, sending its goods and services to many nations. The Lord's words in Matthew also tells us that when the leaves appear, it is an indication that summer is near. Summer represents the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus. From this passage, we can conclude that we are getting very close to summer. These verses come at the end of a chapter in which Jesus had told of the tribulation, the rise of Antichrist, and his second advent to come. He informs his disciples that the generation which would see the fig leaves come forth would be the generation when all these things would come to pass. Uh, Ezekiel chapters 38-39 tell us of a time when Israel will be attacked by Russia, The war will occur in an unprecedented time of peace. 
in Israel as the Russian armies will invade a land of unwalled villages with people at rest, having neither bars nor gates. Uh, Ezekiel 38.11 Through its pursuit of peace with the Arab nations, Israel is moving itself into position for this Bible prophecy to come to pass. This time of false peace will cause the great Jewish military machine to lay down its defenses. Then the leaders of uh, the armies of Gog of Magog will not think twice about attacking Israel. Although the war will be supernaturally won by God for Israel, fear over the future will change Israel's strategy. After this war, Israel will look for a strong ally for protection. It uh, will turn to Europe, which the book of Daniel calls the revived Roman Empire. You know, of course, we've heard of, of the hook in the jaw uh, in the Bible and uh, where Russia is concerned, due to the geographical location of the entire country, it is too far north to have any consistent growing season for crops. For decades, it has depended heavily on foreign countries for its food supply. The need for basic necessities has never been greater than at this present time. Israel, on the other hand, is the breadbasket for all of Europe. The crops grown there are the biggest and best on earth. Israeli crops are on the tables of homes and restaurants around the world. Israel is extremely bountiful in gas and oil, which is more than likely the largest interest uh, the invading armies have. Amen. Therefore, the Russian leadership is developing a great desire to possess the small, fruitful, and energy-abounding nation. Plans have been in place for years for Russia to obtain Israel. But God knew these plans from eternity past and has a very special surprise waiting for the attacking armies. Although they will attack in mass and military might, they will not win. The Bible declares that this battle will be, will be won supernaturally by God. Many of the invading armies... Much of the invading armies will be destroyed. The word of God prophesies it will take Israel seven months to bury the dead and seven years to consume the spoils from that war. Uh, Ezekiel 39, verse 9 and verse 12. Whether or not the church will see this battle or not, I believe the rapture is just before or slightly after it begins. Guys, it just seems easy to recognize that the world center of political power and economic strategies is uh, moving toward uh, the European theater. This confederation of nations have been united to consolidate the immense wealth of formerly independent countries. The church can look for a greater shift of world's investments and business power to this area of the world in, in days to come. Daniel chapters 2 and 7 tell us that this area, the Roman Empire of the past, will drop to ten nations and a leader will arise to control it. The scriptures describe him as Satan's counterfeit of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thus he is referred to as the Antichrist. As in the days when Jesus was crucified, this revived Roman Empire will again dominate Israel under the leadership of Antichrist. What will mark the beginning of the tribulation is a seven-year peace treaty he will draw up with Israel, an agreement he will break after three and a half years. In Jesus' day, Rome destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. In our generation, under the Antichrist rule, will also attempt to permanently erase the Jewish capital and its people. Rome was successful in A.D. 70, but revived Rome's attempt will fail at the Battle of Armageddon when Jesus will return, destroy the Antichrist and his forces, and then we will, he will bring us into his millennial reign. The relationship between Europe and Israel has been in the works primarily because its relationship with the United States, its greatest support and ally in the past, uh, has been diminishing. Guys, we need to look up uh, 1 John 4, 17 says, Herein is 
our love made perfect, and that's what you'd call made mature, that we may have boldness or the confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in the world. Guys, God is confident about the future as he looks down from heaven and, and observes current events. He knows everything is going according to his plan in these last days. I just want to ask a question. But does everybody listening to this video know that? Does all of this excite everybody here or does it scare you? Do you have confidence about the day of judgment? If you don't, you can. Confidence about that day begins with a personal relationship with Jesus today. And it will be strengthened in the days to come by the study and application of God's word. You, we are in the generation which has witnessed the blooming of the fig tree and the coming of summer. The Bible tells us that believers who will go to heaven by way of the rapture of the church will see the second advent from Jesus' side as we return with him in all his glory. Jesus will be on a white horse and we'll be right behind him on white horses, guys. What an exciting time to be looking forward to. With an understanding of passages of scripture like these, you can be as steadfast confident and assured on earth as God is in heaven. As you learn and apply God's word in your life, you will discover a peace-filled assurance in a world filled with chaos and instability. You can say with Jesus, although I hear of wars and rumors of wars and pestilences and earthquakes, I will not be troubled. Guys, Jesus... He's getting ready to come. Uh, I just can't get over some. I, I think about it and I, I stand in awe that, man, I'm going to be seeing Jesus face to face at any time. I I dreamed about that for a long, long time and it getting ready to be a, uh, really getting ready to happen. Amen. I mean, uh, you can just look at the world all around you. I mean, it's, it's uh, the, the fuse is lit. Guys, I have a word of exhortation. My exhortation for this season is God is calling each of us up higher in this very prophetic season. We have learned patience is the key. It is a key to unlock even what has been beyond our imagination the dawn is breaking and the old is passing away. It is time to see the revelations from God that we have waited and waited for. Even though the waiting has been long, we will receive the promise for eternal life at any time. Big moves from God are getting ready to move in big ways. A shift is coming for all things we have been waiting for. God is bringing us out into the forefront to shine like a beacon of hope for the world to see. What God has promised will soon come to pass. Our peace will remain immovable because our trust is in the Lord. Guys, we're getting ready to have a Maranatha moment at any moment. We are standing rapture ready and ready to go. Although the soon coming tribulation is on the rise, the bride of Christ will be rising at any moment. Lord, help us all, God. Give us all strength. Help us to endure Fill us with perseverance, Lord, knowing that the day is approaching. Guys, we pray for you daily. We love each of you. We're so looking forward to seeing each of you in the clouds of glory. See you there. Much love and many bear hugs. God bless you and Maranatha.
Father, heal each one within the sound of our voice, God. Fill them with hope. Fill them with health. Fill them with supernatural strength, O oh God. And if any one of them needs to become born again, save them to the uttermost. Lord, when we are weak and weary, help us to remember from where our hope truly comes. By your grace, keep us from misplacing our faith in worldly things for support. Strengthen us to endure all hardships with confidence, knowing every promise you made will come true. We ask you would rise within each of us and empower us to live better and never bitter. Amen. Be our shalom peace. Keep us within your secret place, high above all turmoils of life. Be God our healer. We ask when we are sick, you would saturate each of us with the healing balm of Gilead, causing us to be free from all pain and sickness. Be God our deliverer and free us from all bondages yes. and evil of this world. We ask you would always restore, renew, and revive each of us all the days of our lives. Yes. Be our strength when we're feeling we cannot go on. Free us from the weight of all worry and fear. Give us rest from the struggles we daily encounter that are wearing us down. We will remember that you, Lord, are with us. You are here. You are powerful. And you are in control. Thank you, Lord, that we can put our hope in you. Because you are our hope. Though the world may be falling apart all around us, we will yet praise your name. We will say of the Lord, he is our refuge and our fortress. Our God will always be our wraparound shield all the days of our lives. You are our Savior. You are our God. Yes. Thank you, Lord, that we can always turn to you and find peace. Be our peace today and always. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. And we will believe by faith that all these things are done in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Guys, we can talk a little bit about the gospel that's found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Verse 4 says, And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Amen. Guys, those are shouting words. Yes, they are. I'm just going to turn it over to Susie and let her present the ABCs of salvation. Hallelujah. And how many know that salvation is as easy as ABC? Yes, it is. The ABCs of salvation. A, admit that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. This is where the godly sorrow leads to genuine repentance for sinning against the righteous God. And there is a change of heart. We change our mind and God changes our hearts and regenerates us from the inside out. Yeah. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins yeah. and was buried and that God raised Jesus from the dead. This is trusting with all your heart that Jesus Christ is who he said he mm -hmm. is. Call upon the name of the Lord. In Romans 10, 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and will believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Every single person who has ever lived since Adam will bend their knee and confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Amen. 
If you want to become born again today, then say something like this. Lord, you said in your word that if I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, that I would be saved. I confess now that Jesus is my Lord and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. For it is with my heart I believe and am justified and it is with my mouth that I confess and am saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in you will never be put to shame. You said that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me and cleansing me and forgiving all my sins, past, present, and future, and forgiving me eternal life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. If you have prayed this prayer, you are now a child of God. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Welcome to the family of God. Amen and amen.